Good evening, good evening, good evening. I'm not going to start my lecture like that very often, but one of my favorite British comedians and TV hosts is uh, Stephen Fry. And that's the way he likes to introduce himself with uh, three greetings, <clears throat> three salutations. So that's how we're starting today. In this lecture, this uh, British and American culture lecture, this is week five, I have decided to split it into two. So be aware that this will be a more manageable chunk than usual. Uh, some of the lectures have passed the one hour mark, which is natural because normally we would have three hours a week. One hour of uh, website, you know, supporting information, textbook reading, uh, supplementary lecture type material, and two hours in the class. So I'm not, don't get me wrong, I'm not going to do two one hour video lectures. Uh, I think that would be a bit much, especially considering other professors are doing much smaller, uh, shorter uh, lectures right now. Um, but I think it would be helpful for you. I'm not gonna shorten the length, but I'm gonna split it in half. So we'll have uh, like a 30 minute sort of lecture about if it goes over a little bit that's just what happens uh, there this is a really big book uh, most freshmen are not used to handling this much material so I do need to go through a lot of stuff but I need to also you know cut it down to um, something that you can digest better so today's lecture is going to get into the 16th century uh, first of all I'm going to talk about the most important thing about that century which is the religious changes that occurred and uh, reflected social changes and cultural changes, uh, economic changes and, and political changes too. So we're going to talk about the Reformation, which is the, uh, the name given for the, the split in the Catholic Church that resulted in uh, a faction called the Protestants, which had all kinds of various types, and the Roman Catholic Church, the, the original church that continued to exist, you know, um, mostly as it was before. There, obviously, it changes slowly too, but the Protestant, some of the Protestant factions were radically different. Um, this, today we probably won't be able to go into the details so much of all the particular different groups that become important. I think that will be next week when we start talking about the Civil War, we'll start to talk about uh, the Puritans and the, the Presbyterians and the Anglicans and how they are different than each other. But for now, I understand that I'm, and if you're Catholic or Protestant, I apologize because I'm just going to generalize about the differences. And part of the reason for that is originally the differences were smaller, but once the revolution took hold, uh, it started to get carried away. And certain people, like Martin Luther, started to pull back from it because they thought it had gone too far. And other people, like the Puritans, they thought it hadn't gone far enough. So before I get into that too much, let me uh, roll back again for a second. We're gonna talk about the, the, the religious changes that were so profound and affected all of Europe, uh, England included, and there were specific things about England that happened that we need to talk about, um, <clears throat> which were, will change you know, England and Great Britain forever. Secondly, we have to talk about the leaders. Now, uh, as a group, I think the kings and queens of the 16th century are the most dynamic in English history. Uh, you'll have people that argue with me about that, but there, there are women, there are men, there are young and old, they're all part of the same family, but uh, the, the drama of this group of people, which we refer to as the Tudors, after Henry Henry the Seventh, which is the the beginning of the Tudor dynasty, they are an interesting group of people, and they are they all have certain personalities, and they they have huge effects on the the changes that, like I explained to you before, the evolution of um, English culture and British culture, and you know um, they're going to increasingly affect Scotland and Ireland uh, throughout the century as well. So this, this is sort of has a ripple effect. At the end of last lecture, the Angevin 
Empire, the, the Normandy, the parts that used to belong to the English king, uh, as the Duke of Normandy and um, Anjou and Brittany and uh, po uh, Poitou. There's all these northern and northwestern and western parts of France that actually belong to the English king. They lost all of them, and that's mostly because of uh, the efforts of the French king who in consolidating uh, France, not as a nation, but as a sort of loyal group of um, duchies um, under his influence. Uh, and of course, the one of the most famous heroes in French history, Jeanne d'Arc, which we in English call, we call her Joan of Arc. So that's behind us now. That's 1453. Um, that's behind us from 1453 until uh, Henry Tudor takes the throne, you have a period we call the War of the Roses, where you have multiple kings from different houses taking over. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, there's four different uh, dynasties that, that take over in one century. So the 15th century is a bit of a mess. The, the English kings lose all their French territories except for Calais. Um, a lot of the kings die. Or, you know, they're boy kings and they disappear and nobody knows what happens to them. And as I said to you before, that's, the in that's some of the inspiration, the main inspiration for um, Game of Thrones. If you've seen that famous HBO series, um, some, some of those things reflect. Uh, it's kind of uh, based on that fundamental, fundamental conflict between all these great houses of England and the one that comes out on top in the end is a, is a surprise. Uh, Henry Tudor is a, in an underdog. He's not one of the bigger houses. The House of York or the House of Lancaster. Um, <clears throat> these are the houses that are represented by the Roses. That's why it's called the, the War of the Roses. But they, they uh, fail and they, are <clears throat> they become unpopular for a variety of reasons, which I will not get into. And Henry Tudor takes advantage of it and gains popular support, and uh, he becomes the King of England. Um, he wins a battle, and um, you know, as Shakespeare says, the 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 crown falls off the king's head and rolls into a hawthorn bush, and he picks it up, and he becomes the king. It's not as simple as that, but essentially, uh, Henry the Seventh, Henry Tudor, uh, becomes a king that stabilizes the English state. The kingdom has been in trouble. Uh, it has been ineffective in, and had poor leadership or at least a lot of factional strife between different powerful people and he settles everything down. Um, what can I say about him? He's not a handsome guy. He's not a military presence. He's not much of a general or a warrior. He's nothing like Alfred or um, I know Alfred I told you he was kind of weak in body but he was a very good military leader um, Richard the Lionheart or Edward the first or Edward the third or Henry the fifth these are all the famous kings that uh, won battles um, Agincourt Henry the fifth won the battle of Agincourt the famous one where the the um, English archers mow down the French nobility who are charging um, them on horses and um, you know that's where the legend arises with the, the two fingers like um, cut off my because that's one of the things they used to do is cut off their fingers so they couldn't shoot an arrow those kings um, were medieval kings so we're we're moving out of the medieval period that I think the best line for us to draw between medieval life and what is we call early modern life the, the start of the change of the English state kingdom into something that's more recognizable. We, we live in a postmodern era, but it's still modern. A lot of the things that um, you, you know about uh, the United Kingdom started in this period. So things like having a, a parliament that actually has influence over the, the country, uh, inclu increasing influence, and um, science and philosophy and English literature, they start to, there is English literature that goes, it comes before it, but it starts to change and it's not so 
everything isn't revolving around religion. That's one of the fundamental differences here, is when you get into the 16th century, at the beginning, you have people like Thomas More, who wrote Utopia. You probably know the word, and if you don't know the origin of the word, it comes from this story that um, a very famous English lawyer and government official named Thomas More wrote. Uh, he wrote about utopia, and if you read utopia, you will not think it's utopian. Uh, it's more like some sort of strange, um, what do you call it, uh, communist? I, I guess there's no, there's property and clothing and, and money are supposed to be devalued there, and the, the emphasis is on equality, essentially, that that um, people, safety, equality, um, it's a socialist sort of idea, but all the things that you enjoy, um, the consumerism that you have, wearing you know, nice clothing and jewelry and uh, enjoying socialization and, and variety, all those things that we um, treasure, uh, at least we, we, many of us would never want to give up, um, he believes are not good for a, a society. So it, the criticism is basically leveled towards, you know, <clears throat> the behavior and the direction of the, the monarchy and how the king controls the state. But um, anyway, he, he, Thomas More, what I'm getting at is he, he has this perspective. He writes it also in Latin, by the way, not in English, which is something that by the end of the century, Shakespeare's not writing in Latin anymore, he's writing in English. Edmund Spencer is writing in English. Ben Jonson, uh, Christopher Marlowe, and all the other great, Philip, Sir Philip Sidney, all the other great writers at the end of the 16th century, they're, they're not using Latin anymore. So that's the, there's lots of aspects of, of society, of culture, that change from the beginning of the century to the end. And a lot of it has to do with religion, okay? So again, I don't want to offend anybody who is Protestant or Catholic. I'm just going to try and point out that some of these things sort of are anchored, you know, at the center of these two perspectives on Christianity. And that they have, you know, very important effects on English society. So when that moment comes, when Catholic England starts to be suppressed. It becomes a, first it becomes a counterculture and then it becomes a subculture and then a, it almost disappears essentially at, over time. Um, that is it, a very, it, it takes a long time, it takes decades, but in terms of history, it's, it's shocking because you know, you're talking about almost a thousand years of uh, a society being built around a certain way of of living, certain buildings, um, certain representatives, leaders, knowledge. As I told you, medieval life revolved around the church. Uh, even if you had a tiny little town, you'd have a tiny little church, and that church would be the most important place. You, When people were born, they went to that church. When they got married, they went there, and when they died, when they wanted help, they went there, and when they had problems, they went there. They went to church for everything. Now that's going to change. 16th century, that's not the case anymore. The church becomes disconnected uh, from the fundamental, you know, uh, social support and uh, political elements that it has been connected to for almost a thousand years. Not quite. I, I think it's more like 900 years, but you get the idea. Um, <clears throat> so let's get into the fundamental differences first. Um, when the when the separation of these of Christianity occurs, um, it's not because Martin Luther was the only revolutionary voice uh, in Europe. Um, he just, you know, I guess it's a matter of timing, really. Other people, as I told you, there was an English guy 150 years before who le he led the Lollardy movement. His name was John Wycliffe, and he had a lot of similar ideas to Luther, but there was one missing element, one missing piece to his effort, which was every book that they tried to distribute and make, produce, had to be done by hand. And so the, just the, the number of 
of books. And of course, there were less people able to read the books as well uh, at the time. So literacy was lower. He had a smaller audience and he couldn't produce the books fast enough. Essentially, the church could just find the books and burn them all. And then uh, he'd have to start over. Once Luther starts writing these, you know, pamphlets and printing them off a printing press, press that's a machine, uh, instead of, you know, slowly making several hundred copies, he could I, not mass produce. Um, it's not like a, it goes once around the world in one day like we have now, but the, the difference is exponential. So you go from hundreds of copies of something to thousands of copies of something, right? It's 10 times more. 10, 10 times more efficient. So Martin Luther is a, a man. He's a, he's a Catholic um, <clears throat> scholar. He's a very interesting guy. I, I wish I could talk more about him. Um, he, had a, he had a temper. He was a pretty passionate, angry person sometimes. Clearly very intelligent. You might even call him a genius if you wanted to. Loved drinking. And uh, apparently one night he uh, had some great ideas. He thought they were great. And just like some people do when they um, drink a little bit too much and then they text somebody or they email somebody and the next day they regret it. I think this is one of those moments where he just got all fired up and he decided, this is, I'm going to do this and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fix this problem. I'm going to write down all of these issues with the Catholic Church and I'm going to stick it to the door. So he goes to... Uh, church in Germany and he he nails it to the door um, supposedly after you know having a good time and getting maybe lubricated somewhat the next day he wakes up probably thinking that was a bad idea but it's too late everybody's heard about it and that triggers this this response which has to do with the timing again so you know Germany is not a unified country and a, a lot of German principalities and cities um, did not like the leadership from Rome. Rome is sucking in huge amounts of money to build St. Peter's Cathedral. They, they're building, you know, angels made of stone. And, you know, it's gorgeous. Don't get me wrong. I think everybody wanted, everybody's happy that they did that. But at the time, you can imagine if South Korea was, you know, or your country, but South Korea, for some of you, um, South Korea was sending, you know, something like 25% of its taxes. We're going to Canada. Since I'm from Canada, thank you. You, you decide that there's going to be this beautiful building. Incredible. It's the most beautiful. It's the largest, most beautiful building in the world. And you pay for it. And most of you never get to see it. Right? Airplane tickets coronavirus, whatever. They build it in Canada with your money, but only a few South Koreans or wherever you're from, wherever the case may be, um, Chinese people or, or, <clears throat> or Uzbek, Uzbek, Uzbek people or whatever it is, you, some of you, maybe you probably the, the richest people get to go check it out, or some people are very dedicated, but almost everyone never sees it in their life. Would, would you be a little bit upset about that? I think anybody would. So the Germans, when Martin Luther points out all this wastefulness and all this excess um, in the Catholic Church, it really resonates with a lot of German people in German cities and German leaders. They're not really happy that all of their money is being funneled into this gigantic building project, which is, you know, a UNESCO World Heritage Site that I would like to see someday but nonetheless it's sucking all the wealth out of Germany and like plopping it down in Rome where nobody can see it um, a lot of northern European countries felt similarly so it kind of caught on uh, and um, because of that they protected him normally the Pope and some Catholic people would just grab Martin Luther take him to Rome put him on trial and then force him to confess recant or kill him burn all his books, but that didn't happen. So that started the whole thing. This ripple effect went across Europe, went through France, uh, every country had a different reaction. But in England, uh, the reaction was negative. Uh, King Henry did not want to um, support at first this idea because Protestant ideas were very dangerous, you know, it, they were it was a populist idea, not an elitist idea. So it's not very good for kings. 
So let me explain the main things that Martin Luther, John Calvin, uh, John Knox, William Tyndall, uh, so these people are all, you know, translators or scholars and philosophers. Um, <clears throat> Zwingli is another one. All these guys basically have in common is the things that they don't like about the Catholic Church. So in the textbook on page 81, I have um, six bullets and they're, again, they're just general ideas um, that, that give you an understanding of what the Catholic Church represented at the time. So, first of all, there's a Pope. He's at the top, he's the boss, right? Second of all, uh, in the Catholic Church, there's all these ceremonies, celebrations, and festivals. The whole, like I said, your whole weddings, funerals, holidays, everything, um, births, everything is celebrated at the church. Um, and all the drinking and everything else is done at the church too. Uh, they also have markets at the church and they do everything. Um, this is all stuff that... Martin Luther and other people think maybe it shouldn't be done at the church or around the church and we should stop doing all these ceremonies because really it, simplicity is, is a better connection to God than partying, okay? They decorate their sanctuaries, St. Peter's Basilica with everybody's money. They make ornate sculptures and stained glass windows. They have very fancy churches um, and art and it's amazing stuff. It's beautiful. But it's expensive. And should the money be spent on people and the poor and, I don't know, health, um, other things, advising, hard work? Or should it be just spent making beautiful buildings? Protestants don't think so. Um, they worship the saints and the Virgin Mary. In the Bible, it says, don't worship false idols. Saints are not God. Therefore, they are idols. So you can't, they don't believe you should do that because in the Bible it says don't. <clears throat> the Bible uh, is only permitted and available in Latin and it's from a certain text called the Vulgate. I'm going to forget who, I'm not going to say who it is. Um, last week I made a big mistake and called, um, I called uh, Thomas Beckett, Samuel Beckett. It's Thomas Beckett. I think it's St. Jerome. I that wrote the Vulgate translation. But uh, they start translating the Bible directly from the, the Greek, um, which reveals that there are mistakes in the Latin translation and, and uh, the, the, the language starts to be available um, in your own, it starts to be available in your own language, in a vernacular language. So there, now there's uh, William Tyndall printing English Bibles, and, you know, Martin Luther printing German Bibles, and, and there's French Bibles, and there's Dutch Bibles, and so on. So people um, can read it in their own language. And it says something a little bit different, usually, than the Catholic version. Because the Catholic version, obviously, was uh, very deeply affected by the, you know, the dogma of the Catholic Church. So the perspective, that the spin that they put on the translation, uh, and the way that they give the message. The Bibles are still the same thing, but the words are different. Um, and they have slightly different meanings. So, yeah. They think, uh, Protestants think, no, it shouldn't be only Latin in that version. And um, basically, this, the Catholic Church says that's the only real version. You can't, you can't have other versions that's uh, illegal. Finally, um, in order to understand even the special version that they, they use, you have to be an ordained priest. You have to be trained properly. You have to be a member of the clergy, and you have to be educated in the Catholic Church. Otherwise, don't try and figure out what it means. Normal people can't do that. Okay? That's Catholic people and what they believe, basically. Now, you have to understand, this is going to be on a test. This is going to be quiz material, if we ever get around to quizzes. Otherwise, it's going to be a component of an assignment or something. So, uh, whenever I read stuff like this or refer to stuff like this, make sure you read these pages carefully, okay? So the Protestant opinion, the, the Protestant way of uh, worshipping is in many ways kind of an opposite or a, an alternative to what the Catholics believe and that's why they can't get along. And they, all the Protestants and Catholics try to kill each other and destroy each other's countries. So uh, they say, the Protestants think uh, the church should be governed not by a pope but by a group of people called a seminary. 
And usually there's an elected leader of some sort. Each Protestant church has a kind of uh, alternative version of that. But, um, and the Anglicans still have bishops, but uh, they don't have a pope. Okay? An emphasis is usually placed on simple worship services, not elaborate ceremonies and various festivals and events. Uh, the sanctuaries, the churches themselves, are more functional and simple, plain. They don't have a lot of decoration. That distracts you from worship, so that's no good. I'm Presbyterian. My father is a Presbyterian minister. Trust me. Um, we do have stained glass windows, but the benches are intentionally really uncomfortable, hard, uh, and wooden. Because you're not supposed to be comfortable in church. No cushions. <laughs> because that, <laughs> you're supposed to be paying attention. You're not supposed to be relaxing. You're not supposed to be looking at the ceiling. I've been to Catholic churches because I went to, uh, I went to school, elementary school, in uh, a Catholic school for one year in Montreal. And I went to a cathedral and I was just looking at everything. There's so many things to look at in a Catholic church. Usually in a, in a Protestant church, uh, you can't get distracted because there's nothing much on the wall, except for the sometimes a little bit of stained glass. Worship of false idols is forbidden because it's commanded in the Old Testament that you don't. Moses brought that, you know, Moses brought the uh, Ten Commandments down and he saw them worshiping a calf and he lost his cool and broke the tablets and yelled at everybody. That's because you're not allowed to worship a golden cow. You're only allowed to worship God himself. Uh, anyone is entitled to interpret the word of God for himself. This becomes a big problem because Martin Luther realizes it's not a good idea for everybody to think something different because nobody can agree on anything. But that is a principle of Protestantism is that if you have a Bible and you want to read it, it it's your right to try to understand it yourself. The, it's a gift to people. And that's not how the Catholics looked at it 500 years ago. It was not a gift for people. It was a gift that God presented to the church and the church would uh, relay it as a conduit from God to the people. There's no direct communication and the Bible is not for regular people. Uh, finally, the Bible should be written in any language you choose. It can be any local language and the Protestants did that. They even translated into native languages so other countries that they were trying to convert to Christianity could also read a version of the Bible in their own language. Uh, normally Catholics didn't do that, although later on things changed, like I said. So those are the fundamental differences between the two religions. Now, <clears throat> I'm not going to get through all the kings uh, and queens today, um, but we do have another lecture. and We're coming up on 30 minutes here, so I'm just going to talk about the Henrys, and then uh, at the end of this lecture, Henry's going to die. And at uh, the next lecture, we'll talk about Edward, Mary, and Queen Elizabeth. Because Queen Elizabeth reigns for a long time, uh, and Shakespeare lives during her reign, and there's all kinds of things, that the conflict with the Spanish that we need to talk about. So, <clears throat> like I said, the revolution in England didn't take off uh, originally very quickly because the king of England was Henry VIII. And Henry VIII, let me explain, Henry VII was not handsome, not tall, not athletic, um, quite pious and serious and very careful with his money. Um, he had a son and a daughter who were older than Henry, but Arthur, his first son, died. Um, Elizabeth was the second daughter, I believe, and she, <clears throat> um, you know, now we're talking about sons being uh, given the, the inheritance the birth order is according to sons, not. And daughters uh, usually get excluded unless there are no sons. So being the second son, we have Henry VIII, who was not expected to be king, but when his older brother Arthur died, and uh, there, that's not an accident that they chose the name Arthur. Henry VII chose Arthur because he wanted a King Arthur, like the legendary one. And he was tall, handsome, and well-liked. Um, and he was betrothed, which means he was going to marry, uh, the queen, <clears throat> um, the princess of Aragon, uh, Catherine of Aragon, um, a Spanish princess. And when the, that um, marriage was arranged, um, it really didn't seem like a great advantage to the English because Spain had not become a superpower yet. They were just, hadn't done the Columbus finding gold and silver and taking over the world thing yet. So, um, 
actually after they did that, the Spanish king kind of tried to say, uh, actually I don't really want to give you Catherine. I'd rather give him to some more important country. But Henry uh, had already got the money and he said, sorry, you gave me the money, so give me the girl. So he was, she, was, she married Arthur, but very soon after that, Arthur died. So now he's got a problem. He's got a uh, Henry who's going to be the king and uh, he's got a queen of Spain that he wants to be married to his family because Spain's such a powerful, rich country now that it's a great thing for England to be connected to Spain. Uh, so he arranges to um, cancel the marriage that happened to Arthur because basically nothing happened. He died really quickly, so we'll just forget it ever happened kind of thing, cancel it out. Uh, and uh, Henry doesn't want to marry this woman because she's uh, a lot older than him. He's just a teenager, late teens. He's a young man and he wants to have lots of girlfriends. He's not interested in this old uh, queen from Aragon, but he does it anyway because he thinks that that's what he should do as king. Um, so when Henry VIII, uh, when, when Henry VII dies, his son, Henry VIII, takes over and he marries this older woman who was his father's wife. So <clears throat> Henry VIII is one of the most famous kings in English history. Uh, on the website, you can see a great, fantastic picture of him standing like this. He's, uh, he's gigantic by that point, and he's got, you know, the face, he's got a pancake face that's like the, you know, half the picture. It's a great picture. He does look very tough and everything, but I mean, he just doesn't look very, he's obviously quite overweight. Um, he doesn't look very healthy or handsome my opinion. But if you look at it, I think you'll agree with me. However, when he was young, supposedly he, he was very charming, dashing, clever. Um, according to what I've read, he, he could speak, read and write, and, and speak five or six languages, English, French, uh, Greek, Latin, and Spanish. I think there's another one too, Italian. Uh, he was musical, he could play musical instruments, and he could compose music he made musical compositions you know like not beethoven but you know church musical compositions that uh some i think a few of them have still survived in the anglican church until today um he was he loved hunting he um he wrestled the king of france one time he lost but you know he's a he's an athletic handsome tall intelligent multilingual person this guy is like superman kind of uh, so everybody's pretty excited about this king. They think they're going to have a great king who's very powerful and an a, and a effective leader. But um, things start to go badly very quickly. <clears throat> he, he has a lot of flaws. One of them is he loves eating and drinking and partying. He doesn't care about money. He likes starting wars that he can't finish and he doesn't organize them well. And he, after his father dies, he starts, if he doesn't like somebody, he kills them and including, unfortunately, his, his wives. I mean, that's one of the reasons Henry is so famous is he killed, you know, half of his wives, he executed. Uh, one of them died uh, because of an infection from childbirth, but um, he executed several of his wives. Um, <clears throat> he, had, he ended up having six. And uh, that's um, what most people remember It's the the wives, Henry, Henry, the, Henry VIII's wives that everybody remembers. That's what he's notorious for. So his, because of his appetites, um, sexual appetites, he, he loved meeting lots of women, um, his wife and other women included. He liked drinking and eating. Uh, he liked spending money. He, had, he just was a, not a temperate man completely different than his father because his father was ex the exact opposite. Henry VII was very, um, he moderated himself pretty well, especially given he was a king. I think it's very tempting for a king just to consume as much as he wants, do whatever he wants because of his position and his power, but his father was a completely different person. Anyway, this is what Henry was. He, he had red hair and he was very tall and uh, he also loved hunting, as I said, so he did have a hunting accident where he... Um, hurt his leg really badly, broke his leg. And uh, at the time, you know, even the king didn't have access to good surgeons or healthcare, so it never healed properly and he was never able to exercise 
Um, usually when he was younger, his drinking and eating balanced off because he was so active. But um, that ability to exercise and burn off all the things, all the bad things he was doing to his body stopped. So you can just imagine uh, how overweight and um, unhealthy he became by the time he was middle age. So this is the Henry that we get. <clears throat> the main problem for Henry ends up being that Catherine seems to not be able to have a healthy child. She has stillbirths, uh, she has miscarriages, um, they lose several baby boys, uh, and eventually she does have one uh, baby that survives to adulthood, which is Mary, uh, which is a daughter, but, he, but Henry doesn't want daughters, he wants a son. Um, so it gets to the point, they've tried for years and years, and she's basically, you know, Catherine's getting older and, and like the window is closed and uh, she's not going to be able to have, uh, try again to have a child because she's too old. So Henry wants a divorce. Catherine doesn't want him to divorce her. Uh, the Pope doesn't want her, him to divorce either. Um, but he thinks that um, it's essentially he's very pious and faithful. So he thinks that, I mean, he... he says this is what he thinks. We don't really know how much he believes this, but anyway, he claims that it is, he's done some sort of sinning against God because his, he married his brother's wife. So this is the justification he, he makes to the Catholic Church is that I am Catholic and I believe in the Church, but I need to divorce my wife uh, because I need to have a son. And the reason that this is, I can do this is because she's my brother's wife and I shouldn't have married her. That's why all these babies are not surviving because God doesn't like it. Okay, so this becomes what people refer to as the king's great matter, which is it causes stress across the entire country. Everybody wants him to have a son, most of all him. Uh, and, but everybody, like Catherine is quite a good queen. She's done nothing wrong. So when she tries to defend herself, uh, and not get removed or divorced, uh, there's a lot of sympathy for her. So there's this big tension that goes on. And, uh, the whole thing is very complicated in a way, but the end result is that the Pope refuses to allow the divorce to happen. And Henry says, fine, then I'm going to separate the English church from the Catholic Church. So he starts what's called the English Reformation. Martin Luther starts it in Germany and then all these churches start following his style of worship and in England they start doing it differently too. But they don't change at first with Henry. They don't change the way they worship very much. It's very much Catholic except there's no Pope. That's step one. In 1534 um, this, this uh, act is created called the Act of Supremacy, which makes him the effective leader of the church. Now, he gets the benefit of the, of the divorce, and I, I think that's true, that the divorce was the main purpose of this separation from the church, but there's two other huge factors that are just too important to ignore, and Henry is not... You can say whatever you want about him, how terrible he is. He's a murderer, he, he executes people, he uses people, he's angry, you know, he, has un, he doesn't control his appetites. You can say so many bad things about him, but he is not stupid. That uh, you cannot say. So he was very much aware of two other things. One, he gets to divorce his wife, and he gets to try again for a son. Most important thing, maybe, but that's just number one. Number two... Okay, now we don't have to listen to the Catholic Church. I can control the political environment and unify England like no other king has been able to do since, you know, the Norman Conquest. William certainly made everybody behave by killing some, a, a lot of the people who didn't listen to him. But Henry essentially says, okay, I'm the political leader and the religious leader. So whatever I say, don't question it. Just do it. Okay. Uh, so he's got this, these, the, like, uh, and we actually, uh, in Western states, in modern Western states, we, we say that you can't do that because having religious and political power in, in one person's hands is quite dangerous. It's too much, we, we believe. Anyway, uh, you have a potential there for just somebody dominating the entire society and not having any way of resisting them. Remember Thomas Beckett 
yeah, he was sort of blocked the king from doing things. There's nobody who can block King Henry. He's kind of become an authoritarian king almost at this point. So that's, he loves the power, right? He gets his divorce so he can marry this young lady called Anne of Boleyn. Uh, and she will give him a daughter, Queen Elizabeth, future King Queen Elizabeth. And he gets the power. Plus, the third thing is, the Catholic Church owns, the, man, the monasteries of the Catholic Church own about 15% of the entire country of England. And once he, he basically cuts off the Catholic Church, he confiscates that land. So that 15%, that huge amount of land, and it's night, it's not rocks in the corner, um, it's not swamps uh, and or or low value lands. These are, you know, they're, they're big buildings, they're manors, they're farms, they're estates. Uh, it's good land, it's valuable land, and it's very, it's a lot of wealth. And he gets that too. So he gets a new wife, he gets the power, and he gets the money. Those are the three things that he gets out of the deal. So King Henry <clears throat> ends up having... Um, Going through, his second wife was Anne. She ends up having a, a daughter. And the daughter is Elizabeth, Princess Elizabeth. Uh, we'll talk about her later. But he was obviously very disappointed. Anne causes him lots of trouble. But the biggest thing is that she doesn't give him a son. So she gets rid of her by cutting her head off. We won't explain in detail what happened, but she got accused of treason. Um, she was found guilty. They cut her head off. Supposedly she was cheating on him. So yeah, he cut her head off and a, a bunch of other guys that she was supposedly meeting. So he gets rid of her and then he very quickly marries another woman. Um, <clears throat> her name is Jane Seymour. And the third queen gives him a son. And then shortly after that, she gets a, a sepsis infection and she dies. And... Um, now he has what he wants, but he continues to marry other women um, without having much success. But the sixth one um, outlives him and takes good care of him. So he ends up having six in total. But the first three are the important ones really for us because the first one is Catherine of Aragon. She, she has Mary, gives him Mary. Um, the second one is uh, Anne of Boleyn and gives him Elizabeth. And the third one is Jane Seymour, Queen Jean Sa Jane Seymour, and she gives him Edward. And he will become the king when Henry dies. Did you get all that? <sighs> all right, this is the way it goes in the classroom. So yeah, I'm talking a little bit quickly. Remember, uh, I told you, all of you, there are English subtitles. Press the button on the bottom of the video. And even though I'm talking quickly, uh, I think I am pronouncing things fairly carefully. I didn't wear my headset today because I just forgot to charge it. So this had to be done. Um, but anyway, I think you can hear my voice uh, pretty well. You don't have to listen to this twice, but that might help. Also, turn on the subtitles. There's no Korean subtitles, sorry about that. But uh, English subtitles, will uh, it'll show you um, what I'm saying as I'm saying it. If that is helpful, please turn them on. That is part one. Uh, this is the lecture for Monday.